Thank you so much for being here. I could imagine probably 10 years ago, I talk about the deal with the net, so, so many people. So thank you very much for coming. And I hope there are not too many lawyers in the room. Can I ask you how many lawyers we have in the room? Ah, okay. That, that's okay, only, only two, sorry. The Bible will say nice, I, I promise that. And I, I've been asked to do something almost impossible. To do in 45 minutes, what is relevant from a major perspective in video games with a deep dive in open source and artificial intelligence. So this is the promise of the talk. i uh, totally gonna fail, but I'll try to give you the, the gist of what are the issues that you should be more familiar with. Because it's an overchanging environment, it's an overchanging world, and a lot of the IP questions are still there to be answered. There are a lot of pending cases. There are a lot of contractual aspects it has not been assessed by courts. So you see them in license, you see them in thermal uses, but uh, I cannot guarantee that they can be enforceable in all the scenarios. And there are a lot of cool things going on. And in the video game industry, there is a fundamental tendency. Uh, we tend to do things first and ask the question later. <laughs> so we are in that period in which uncertainty is there, but of course, decision has to be made because importantly, video games needs to be launched. Uh, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Gaetano Dimita. I'm a lecturer at uh, Queen Mary University of London, and I only do this. My, my specialism is interactive entertainment law, and uh, I do mainly IP contract and regulation on, on video games. I like to call it interactive entertainment law because I do believe that video games became much more than uh, what anyone would think about when they, someone mentioned video to them. We move on from Pac-Man substantially in the last 40 years. I, uh, rest of the CV, you can do it online. We can get back to some of these uh, things later, but let's move on. I'm gonna go through what a video game is from an IP perspective. And this is gonna be a crash course. I want it to be as interactive as possible. So please interrupt me anytime if something that is not clear. I don't promise I can clarify it. Or if you have any question to, to, to ask me, and I cannot promise that I know the answer to those questions. Uh, most probably my answer to any of your question will be depends because it will depends on a lot of things that we we will get through this the complexity of looking at ip in video games is determined by the three different level of complexity that exists so they are complex ip product and service they are not static this is the major difference with film and music you record a piece of music you record a film the, the moment is shipped that is the film, that is the music. Video games, the, the uniqueness is their interactivity, the, part, the, the aspect that we love, that is the interaction, the immersiveness, the participation of the player with the video games. And this creates a lot of interesting legal questions. On top of that, uh, players tend to be highly creative and technologically hub people. So they like to play around with the video games and they like to create on top of the video games or using assets of the video games or modifying the video games per se. Not only they are complex IP product and or services, they're also entangled in a very complex uh, uh, contractual matrix. All the license coming from third party software, uh, first party uh, platform, uh, IP, third parties IP within the video game, and then the license to the publisher and then the license for the distribution and so forward. All of this is an entanglement that at the end ends with end user license agreement and term of services. And at this point, I ask it every time, has any of you ever read an end user license agreement or term of service in their life? That's amazing. Thank you. Two, three people. I mean, I, I do it for work. So, I mean, I, I don't count. Was it for pleasure or you were actually looking for something? Please tell me for pleasure. <laughs> Now, and this is amazing because a lot of the rules, a lot of the thing that you can or cannot do is written there. And most of the time we click agree without, uh, without caring because of course you don't care until a problem arises and at that moment it's too late. So it's a, it's a catch 22 and, and, and this is true. I mean, everything is governed by this uh, end user license agreement and uh, very few people know what is written there. And th this is a problem, but we don't have time to, to discuss this problem. On top of that, global business, global dissemination, we have to deal with a very complex regulatory system because every single jurisdiction, while IP to some extent is kind of harmonized to some extent, regulation is not uh, 
fully harmonized globally. So you also have to take in consideration the different jurisdiction will have different ways to deal with different issues. And I think there's something that probably everyone remember. We kind of dealt with it with loot boxes. I, I, loot boxes is over, right? We can stop talking about loot boxes. But it's an example on how different jurisdictions look at regulation in a different way. And most of the time, video games are kind of misunderstood or, or not entirely appreciated. Uh, even the latest uh, form of regulation, they tend to look at social media, they do look at tech giant, they tend to look at uh, uh, film and music again. And video games, they suffer this regulation, but they're never part of the actual discussion and thinking on how to solve the specific problem in that particular jurisdiction. Automatically, this three layer of complexity creates overlap, mismatches, and uh, questions that are really difficult to answer. I'll leave it there because this is a list on what I think video games are, not just, you know, the game per se, but they are evolving into something much more complex and much more immersive. I don't want to mention the metaverse, but I, I just did. There is, uh, uh, I know the IP is already over, but that's kind of the direction. Persistent online environment and interactive online environment, the most successful of which tend to be video games. So it's something that we should start taking in consideration. But this is the core. If there is only one thing that you want to remember from this talk, and I hope you might remember something more than just this, this slide. What I want you to be familiar with is the concept of IP strategies. Because intellectual property law is there. You want it or you don't want it is there. It's there to protect your creation. But of course, it's also there to protect other people's creation against wrongdoing. So it's something that you constantly have to take into consideration. And when I say IP strategy, it's not something grandiose. No, it's just the way you want to maximize your IP and at the same time avoid potential infringements. And this avoiding potential infringements is really, really important because even if you are right, might be time consuming and expensive to deal with an infringement case. So avoiding the obvious uh, saves time and saves money. And in video games, this is complicated by the fact that uh, almost every single video game is a mix of original content and licensed content. So you don't create everything from scratch. You might use uh, uh, third-party software. You might use third-party IP. You might use uh, or, or, or actually pay someone to create something that you want to include in the video game. And this has to be immediately understood because there is a different ways in dealing in a, with IP when you are creating something or where you're getting something that is already protected by something else. And of course, at the beginning, most of the time, you just create, you just invest in something new. You want to do something innovative. You want to do something in, in, fun, creative, uh, hopefully successful. And in the first part of the creative process is where most of the time you create the issues. Because of course it's fun, you're just meeting with friends, you want to create something new, and uh, you might create an amazing video against the devil you want to ship. But at that point in time, maybe one of the three original friends left the group. And maybe it drove the main character or the main piece of code on which the entire engine is based and maybe left uh, not in the best term possible. Now, at that point in time, if you didn't have anything in writing and there was no license or assignment of their rights in their creation to ideally a company or at least some agreement in writing with the group, you will have to chase that person down and try to negotiate a license. Otherwise, your video game is dead in the water. So having a clear understanding on what are the rights that you have to collect is fundamental because my be equivalent of just uh, wasting two or three years of your life just because you didn't do your own work. The other thing that I want you to remember, always read what you sign. I mean, it sounds obvious. Uh, I'm not your lawyer, so don't take anything that I say as a, as a legal advice. I do have a lawyer, but definitely not, not yours at the moment. So don't, don't believe me uh, on, on what I say, but read everything that you sign. Read every single contract, every single license. If you don't understand something, ask for help. 
There is so much help that is available online with guides, guideline, uh, Reddit and Discord group. But of course, ideally, uh, deal with someone that is uh, qualified and importantly also as an insurance in case it tells you something that is, that is wrong. So ask for clarification. And it's not too scary, it's not expensive. Uh, there are a lot of universities that offer like legal clinics. You just walk there, you tell them what the problem is or the aspect of the license you don't understand. And they're there to, to help you understand those specific things. Because the moment you agree with it, might be tricky and expensive to get, get out of what you sign. The other suggestion is when you're creating new IP, always do, sorry, this might sound obvious to you, do a search. Uh, I'm gonna make an extreme example. Let's say you're designing a mouse and you want to call it Mickey Mouse and you never heard of Mickey Mouse and you never heard of Disney. That is gonna create you problem. Of course, this is absurd, but there are a lot more, and probably I can ask you every single one of you, you do have an example or something that is offensive in a foreign language is, uh, is connected to something very negative or it's a registered trademark somewhere else. Now, the fact that you include it in your video games can become a problem later on, something that you have to change or something you have to get a license on. The fourth one is, is the fundamental one. I'll, I'll come back a lot, especially when we're going to deep dive in open source and artificial intelligence. Keep very good records on everything that you create and everything you use. Because uh, re going back in time and trying to figure out from where you got that inspiration, from where you copy and paste that piece of code, might be extremely time consuming and risky. So having a good record of all the assets that you use and is going to be helpful not only for retracting the origin of that asset you are creating, the inspiration of that assets, but also for determining when and if you want to go full protection in IP. If you want to use it to register a trademark, if you want to use it to, uh, to build your entire merchandising on that particular asset. Or could be also a defense in case someone is claiming, for instance, for copyright infringement. Because in that case, you could prove, no, I didn't copy for you. It was an independent creation that was inspired by A, B, and C. Last two points, very quickly, it is important that everyone in a team is slightly familiar with IP. Not to do the most obvious wrong things, but also to be ready to flag out if there's something that might be worthy. We will go through, we will, uh, I, I, I'll give you examples. Depending on the different form of IP, and uh, in a minute uh, we, will, we will discuss them, uh, you will see that some form of IP, like, like copyright, are immediately there at the time you create something or at the moment you put, you put it in writing, you, you fix it. Other form of IP, like trademarks, patent, particularly expensive, and design, you have to register them. They're not scary expensive, except, except patent is a little bit more expensive, but most of the time can be worth it. Remember, at the end of the day, IP is actually how you're gonna monetize your game at the end. It's a good thing to start thinking about and to be ready to, to invest it. In doubt, and this is again, because I'm not your lawyer, ask permission if you're using something that is being created by someone else. There is an asterisk because sometimes you could use it without actually paying a license because it's within limitation exception. But remember, I think I'm gonna mention it a few times in this talk, limitation exception are, are based on one jurisdiction. So every country may have different limitation exception or different interpretation or limitation exception. So the fact that you can do it in the UK might not mean that you can do it in France. And if you're going for a global distribution, that, that's, that's kind of tricky. It's not something you want to, to deal with. Other piece of advice, and then we start talking about the various form of IP and how to deal with the open, open source and artificial intelligence is to constantly do risk assessment. I'm pretty sure you do it with code with, you, with other aspects of the development project. But if you start every time you create an asset, just, just put it in a block, number it, put it in a block and say, OK, this is fine. I mean, I created it myself. I didn't copy it from everyone. This asset is fine. I can forget about it. And then on, on, on another column, all the things that you know they are bad. For instance, using Mickey Mouse, using uh, Darth Vader, these are things that <laughs> they are not going to go well at the end. You put in the don't list. And at that point, later on, you will make the, the, the business decision that if you want to keep them, you're going to apply for a license, you're going to negotiate for a license, or otherwise, 
you change them because it's not worth using it. In the middle, there are all the potential risk. There are all the things that in which my direct answer would end up with a depends answer. And this is the tricky one because this is the one in which an analysis has to be done and a business decision has to be taken because, of course, at some point you have also to do the math. Is it worth clearing or is better to change it and just not to include it? As you notice in the potential risk, artificial intelligence and open source software is there because it's still a potential risk. Not because it's a potential risk to automatically infringe one form of IP, but there are considerations that you have to make because open source licenses come with consequence and you have to be fully aware of it. In artificial intelligence, there are still some questions that need to be clearly answered by court. And there are risks, not only on the potential infringement, but also on the lack of protectability of what you create with artificial intelligence. So these two big problematic on both sides of the spectrum. And, uh, and then you, you, you decide, you evaluate the aspect, you do your risk analysis. If it's your main character and it's something crucial and, 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 and conceptually fundamental to your game, it's better if that asset is on the safe side <laughs> instead of continuing working. If it's something peripheral that can be easily changed, then you can postpone the decision closer to, to launch day. On the safe side, it's also the thing, the, the, the aspect, the, the, um, the column in which you have to start thinking, how can I maximize the monetization of my IP? This is my creation. This On this, I'm going to register a trademark. I wanted to register a design. Or this is a fundamentally innovative piece of technology I want to get a patent on. It's better to know from the beginning, because the sooner you actually register, the sooner you can actually build upon on top of your creation how to monetize extra on that particular form of IP. I mentioned IP like 100 times, what they are. These are just the main copyright, trademarks, patent, design. I'm not using personality right, trade secret is there, even if we can argue if it's a form of IP or, 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 or not. But this is just a list of all the assets within a video game that could actually belong to one or multiple form of IP. Because these form of IP are all there to protect different things and they're there to protect you against different uh, potential wrongdoing. The most complex of them to be dealt with in practice is actually copyright, because copyright is not registered. While trademarks, patent design, the rest, except in secret, you have to register. You fill an application, and the trademark and design office, they issue you the trademark and the patent. People can oppose. It goes in a database. And is there. You know that it's there. You are protected for particular goods and services in particular jurisdiction where you're registered. While copyright, and uh, I have a lot that I want to say, that's why I'm talking so fast. While copyright uh, doesn't need to be registered in order to exist. The moment you create an amazing new uh, piece of music, it is protected already. But this also means that two people can independently create the same piece of music. I know it sounds uh, stretching it, but in theory, copyright protects you from someone else copying your work. So independent creation are okay. Copyright protect them both. They're not infringing each other. And it's not registered. Yes, in the US, there is a registration system. If you publish in the US, definitely the lawyer there suggested you to register copyright. The registration in the US is not for existence of copyright. It's just so then you can cl claim punitive damages. It's a, it's, a, it's a database that the copyright office has in the US. If you register, it's still protected by copyright. You just get less money if someone copies you. Moving to copyright, copyright is already a complex aspect a complex form of IP, uh, and there are fundamental differences between jurisdiction and jurisdiction. When it comes to video games, it becomes even more uh, confusing, confusing to deal with. Because even at the basis, it's really uh, different how different jurisdiction uh, deals with the fundamental question of what a copyright is, uh, what a video game is under copyright law. So in some jurisdictions, they consider software plus uh, a complex work, uh, a software plus uh, audiovisual work. And this is constant that we're going to deal with in a minute. And of course, there are ongoing discussion on the level of copyright protection that is accorded and the consequence of this protection when you're dealing with interactivities. 
So when people play the game, let's play videos, esports, they're all part of a creative use of a video games. They create interesting questions. Of course, this is just to give you an idea of the copyright problematic, but I want, to, because of the audience, to focus on, 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 on the crux, on the question most often asked. To what extent can you protect with video games, with, with copyright of video games? And can you protect the most important aspect? In my opinion, I hope you agree because I'm, I, 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 I'm the lawyer, you're the, 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 the doers, uh, the game mechanics, the, the, the gameplay, the, the, the core of the video game. Because while generally it's considered something not protected by copyright because it's closer to being an idea or a mechanics than an expression of an idea that is what copyright protects, there are a number of cases, especially in the US, that are pushing the definition of what copyright can protect. And I just want to show you a, a number of, of examples connected to cloning because legal nature and, and protectability of mechanics might not be immediately understandable, but I guess everyone here knows what cloning is, and I don't have to make example about that. Cloning is, uh, I don't want to use copyright term, but it's like creating another game that is using the same or similar mechanics, generally changing all the audiovisual elements of that particular game. Why? Because uh, the mechanics is actually for everyone to be used. It's not protected by copyright. It's actually the audiovisual element or the underlying software that are protected by copyright. Are you familiar with this video game, Crash the Castle? So I, 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 I cannot make the joke here, but if you ask to law students, most of them, they don't know Crash the Castle. They know Angry Birds, and they always think that this is a clone of Angry Birds, while historically it's the other way around. But this is... A, 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 critical example because the mechanics are more or less the same. I mean, you're using a catapult to destroy a castle, but the graphics, the graphic, the, the, the interface, the assets are entirely different. So while this could be argued that one of them is a clone, it's not a copyright infringement. It will depend on your definition of clone. But let's talk about cases that actually happen and how difficult it is to determine whether or not an infringement took place. I took a 1980s uh, case, uh, okay, because I was a big fan of, of Pac-Man, but also because with pixelation, the argument is uh, easier to be made. Um, Casey Munkin, you probably, most of, some of you, I mean, I'm checking at the white here, remember it, but Pac-Man was a huge success. There was a, a multiplicity of clones going after that market base of coin operated machine and there are i think three cases about pac-man in in the us but i want just very quickly show you that even though the the two games are very similar uh the copyright infringement was not found because uh uh, the mechanic of the game, the Pac-Man chasing the ghosts, uh, the peels, uh, or the shape of the maze. At the end of the day, what the expression that has been copied, the most clear expression that has been copied, was the Pac-Man. A very simple design of a margarita pizza missing one slide that is still one of the strongest, honestly, IP in video game. I mean, I don't know if the first license was for 40 years has been renewed. There are movies about Pac-Man. The core IP of the video game, on top of the success of the video games, was the Pac-Man itself. And Casey Music, Milkin, uh, diseased. I mean, this is at least what they say in the, in the video. But we have more recent case, and especially in the early 2010, 2015, there's been a lot of case law coming from the US involving a lot of, of games that were recreated. This is, for instance, Tetris is one of the probably most important case in the US, where Xeo Interactive, uh, this is the clone, was found uh, infringing of the copyright in Tetris. Now, understanding, if you look at it, uh, the texture is different. The, the, the look of the pieces is different. The only thing in common, if there are this Tetromicon, and I don't even know if I pronounce it correctly, because I'm never, <laughs> this is the name of these pieces. They're just combination of four blocks. Uh, where a selection, I mean, mathematically there are 11 versions, seven or eight are chosen to be played Tetris, and that was considered a creative decision and then deemed to be protectable by copyright. So in this case, CEO infringed copyright in Tetris. 
I have the video of the two games. We will save it for another time because I want to mention another case. There was later settled. I think Spryfox bought Lola apps, so the, the case was, uh, wasn't decided at the end. But this is a classic example of a mobile phone game in which a lot of the graphic user interface and asset decision is actually dictated by, by functionality, by the form of the screen and by the nature of the game. I mean, I'm pretty sure you can mention me three or four more examples of very popular video games. They use this technique of, uh, you know, hierarchical structure of the object. You put three objects together, you get a better object and so forward. If you look at the two screenshots from the expression of this element, they are different. Yes, they are bushes, they are trees. Uh, there is a nemesis that is uh, a bear on one side and a, and, a, and a yeti on the other side. To be honest, before reading the case, I didn't know that that was a bear, but uh, it, it is a bear. And when you look at, at the playability of the game, again, I, I'll share the presentation. You can look at the video. The mechanics are exactly the same, but one would assume that since copyright protect only the expression, since the expression is different, that should be fine. However, this is not what the court said in the US. At the end of the day, these elements were, were very similar and they were trying to achieve the same result. At the end of the day, grass on one side, ice on the other side. However, there are so many things that have been slightly changed that the court were really felt really uncomfortable to let it be. The case was later settled, but show you that uh, even though by the letter of copyright, the pure expression should be protected, sometimes judges may have tendency to go a little bit over. And this is even more relevant because this is a, a case in Europe. This case is in France. It's, I'm going to say a couple of things that you will disagree with because the judge said it. I don't fully agree. I don't know how to move the video. It's, uh, over here. Have you ever played this video game? I read in case comment, they say that it's the most be played video game ever. It's, it's, it's good work. It's a simulation game or creating an object with a sizzle on a rotating piece of wood. Apparently, it's, it's something people do for real. I, I, I didn't know. Sorry, my, my, my ignorance. But it's an object. Now, this is the video game of the plaintiff. And this, at minute six, if I can find it. And this is the defendant. Hmm. Now, the thing is, they are very, very similar, not, not almost identical. But it, the issue was, if you're trying to recreate something as simple as this mechanic in a video game, how many alternatives there are in depicting that particular simulation. Now, the judge here in France came with something I, I don't fully agree with. It's probably uh, the problem with Google Translate. It's not exactly what the judge says, it's what I understood, that uh, uh, a simulation of something that happens, of a mechanic that happens, is not actually protectable by copyright. I would disagree with the statement because I imagine there are a lot of really creative way and potentially protectable way of recreating a simulation of something that happens outside of a video game. And in this case, the judge say, you know what? There is no, it's not an, there is no enough originality. You're just recreating something that happens in reality. You're not putting any creative input. You're just doing it because this is how it look. Carving a piece of wood on a rotating machine looks exactly like this. These are the sizzles. There is nothing uh, created that you're putting it. However, and that's the interesting bit, even if there is not copyright infringement, still is unfair competition. Because the reason you did it is just to take advantage of the popularity of that particular game, and you're trying to create something similar just to move away a user and consumer for video game A to video game B. So even things that are straightforward, the moment you look at the complexity of AP, copyright, patent, trademarks, design, and unfair competition, there are a lot of other things to be considered. This is a third example very uh, similar approach on looking at uh, similarities beyond what historically you would consider protected by copyright. This is a Chinese case in which similar discussion happened. Even though they're totally different system, the, the US and, and Europe, here again, the question were the same. Slightly different object, uh, achieving the same functionalities, but at the end of the day, a lot of important copyright question, but definitely an act of unfair competition. And unfair competition is not harmonized globally. So you will have different system, 
in different jurisdictions. That means that in case something goes on, you will have to find local courts cases in different jurisdictions. Even in Europe, you will not get a European injunction. So that was copyright, just to, to, to make it a, as confusing as possible. Copyright protect uh, original expression, but if you notice how in the details you can lose a lot of what that is actually mean. And it's always better to understand what does it mean to be original, what is the expression and what the margins of the today's case law is. Patent is what most people tend to be scared of. I mean, a, a lot of conversation about being scared of infringing a patent or getting a, a letter from a patent troll. Uh, patent is arguably probably the strongest form of IP, can protect the hardware, can protect the software, but to some extent, even if it's much more common in the US than in Europe, it can protect the video game mechanics. If they are innovative, I always suggest, and, and I leave it there, if you think that you're doing something really innovative and inventive with your game, could be anything, could be the way you deal with the library or any aspect of your video and that you yourself consider it, contact a patent attorney, have a chat with them, see if there is the possibility to register a patent. It's a really strong protection. And plus, it shows how good your, 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 your creativity is, how good your team is. And it's something that most of the time, uh, you can also license outside of your video game. It can eventually become much more valuable sometimes of the video game per se. Patents gets a lot of bad publicity, mainly for these two patents. I, can, I don't know if you're familiar with the split screen uh, patent in the US, or have you ever heard of the Nemesis patent against in the US? Then I'll skip it. If you haven't heard of them, I'm not going to open that kind of worm. But remember, patent is a very strong form of protection, but it only protects uh, the claims that you write down in your patent application. So most of the time, it gets misrepresented, misrepresented by, by news and by journals. Trademark. This is very powerful form of IP based on registration. It protects uh, basically anything that is dis distinguishable in your your video game. At the moment, whenever you register it as a category of goods or services in a particular jurisdiction and you use it, you get a, pr a protection that as far as you pay and you use it is perpetual. Don't only think about the name of the game, the name of your studio. There are a lot of things that can be registered under trademark and it's a very, very strong uh, form of IP protection. Of course, enforcement might be expensive and time consuming, but it's something to take into consideration. And on top of the classic, you think Amy Weber was the first person to register an avatar as a trademark. That, that was Second Life. So it's something really, really old. You can do it, of course, count with consonants. But there are a lot of other aspects uh, um, aspect of trademark that can be extremely useful. This is, and I, I'm not going to show you the video. It's pretty graphic. Uh, I don't know if you heard about this, the key kill cam uh, trademark application. It didn't go through. It didn't go through for a lot of discussion on... Uh, I'll skip that. But probably it wasn't distinctive enough and probably the video was too long, basically. But if you want, if there is some aspect of uh, your multimedia, in all any aspect of your multimedia that you consider particularly distinctive and you want to use it as a trademark, register it as a trademark because it's an amazing form of protection and tends to be even cheaper to enforce than, than copyright, where you notice how long we spent on, on, on copyright to determine what copyright protect. Trademark is much more straightforward because you register. What you register is what is protected. And competitors cannot use it in, in course of business. But also trademarks open up a lot of, uh, of possibilities because, uh, again, you can register as a trademark a character, a weapon, uh, a, a visual asset in your video game, music, all things that then can be used outside of the video game. And they become very, very uh, useful. I I I'll show you in a minute, because of course it can create an a new line of monetization connected to your games, outside of games. Not only merchandising, but also a single virtual items within different environment. Quick highlights, but I think I mentioned everything already. Point on third party use. Uh, are you familiar probably with all these images? Sometimes it's very difficult to determine whether or not you have to get a license or not. For instance, uh, one of the crucial ones is the Eiffel Tower. 
The Elfels Tower copyright is not perpetual, so it lasts for 70 years after the death of the author. And you would assume that since the Eiffel Tower has been, uh, the uh, architect of the Eiffel Tower died more than 70 years ago, it's not protected anymore. So you can freely use it in your game. However, there is, uh, there is a caveat. Uh, the Eiffel Tower is in France. In France, uh, uh, lighting displays are protected by copyright. And on the top of the Eiffel Tower, there is a lighting display. On top of that, the Eiffel Tower, if you go on the website, they do license images of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> so if you distribute your game in France and the Eiffel Tower is particularly predominant in your game, uh, I, I, I will clear it. I mean, again, I'm not your lawyer, but it's something I strongly suggested to do. On the other side, is, again, I want to stretch out the importance of the jurisdiction and how difficult it is to have a global perspective, the envy. You would assume that if you want to use a car, a Jeep in your game, you should get a license because, for instance, don't try a Formula One video games without getting the clearance from the various companies because they're going to they're gonna stop you. They're, they're going to stop the launch of the video game. But on that, and in particular, there was a very important decision in the US in which the court basically say you cannot have a... Uh, a realistic video game during uh, the Iraq war, I think that was Afghanistan, uh, of the Afghanistan war, if you don't have the Andy. If you change the Jeep, if you use another Jeep, that wouldn't be realistic. So it was part of the creative decision for hyperrealism to include that form of IP. And so that was fine. That was for use. That wasn't an infringement. Of course, uh, Activision Blizzard had to go to court <laughs> to, to determine that. On the other side, most of the time, you will see, that especially if you want to use brand in your video games, there are a lot of agreement that you can do with the brand. There is an increasing interest in, in, in uh, non-tech companies in creating a connection of video games. And especially uh, luxury brand, luxury brand from the past. Sorry, I said from the past, I shouldn't. That was terrible. Uh, but I mean, there are Louis Vuitton, Gucci. They do have an important problem. That probably 14, 15 years old people today, they have no idea they exist. So they, it's important for them to brand in video games to create a new, a new market. Uh, so don't be afraid to ask permission. You remember the asterisk at the beginning? A phone call. Most of the time, e even Disney answered to phone call if you want to uh, discuss something, something like a partnership, an agreement. And below is characters. Another form of IP is personality, right, that also is not harmonized internationally, but they're very strongly protected in some major jurisdiction in which you want to market the video game. You're all familiar with Kenny Reeves. Kenny Reeves now is in video games in three different forms. John Wick, uh, Johnny Silverland, and uh, uh, Neo from the Matrix. It's always him, but it's three different characters of the video games, both linked to uh, the licensing of the personality right or to the movie or directly to the video game companies. And uh, uh, Gerald, I mean, the, the Witcher is one of my favorite one because probably it's the most licensed uh, fictional character, even before the, the 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 TV series and the third recreation of the Witcher. The Witcher has been strongly licensed to other video games. Tattoos, probably you read it on the news. Another thing that is extremely problematic. In this case, you get a license from the athlete. The athlete has a tattoo. Uh, the tattoo artists file a lawsuit against the video game companies. This decision is probably really wrong uh, because the court found for the tattoo artists. So th th they had to pay damages to the tattoo artists because of the tattoo included in the athletes. Uh, the damages were so low, they probably wasn't worth to appeal the case. But it's something that even if you do your best, your clearance, and you go through all the details, there are something unexpected that can happen. Are you familiar with this other decision in the case was later settled, but even if something has gone on for ages, doesn't mean that then the uh, IP owner might not intervene and ask for changes. Uh, Manchester United has been renamed because the football club, uh, club claim a trademark infringement. The case wasn't decided. It's, it would have been important to be decided, but of course uh, the, the parties, of course it would have been important for me for it to be decided. I don't think that the party agrees with this uh, statement. Another connection with trademark is fictional trademarks. Using in video games trademarks, they are not actually exist in the real world, but still they can have very strong uh, monetization uh, outcome. 
Uh, normally in fictional travel, until cyberpunk, I would always use the Duff beer from, from The Simpsons, but now probably Arasaka or even the, the, the samurai, the, the band within cyberpunk become independent IP that can create merchandising on top of the video game. On cyberpunk, uh, we, we, we did an entire studies on, on, on the monetization of IP, because if you, if you think about the game, have you, have you played the pen and paper game, cyberpunk? So I can judge you. <laughs> I can judge you. Yes, it is an entire universe. It is an entire environment. What are you getting a license about? Most of the things that we imagine cyberpunk are not written in the pen and paper book. So Project did an amazing job in recreating this IP and actually pushing uh, substantially outside of the video game this form of IP. Finally, and then we go in, into very quickly deep dive. I don't know how much we're with time. Five minutes. Okay, I do apologize to everyone. Uh, of course, video games can also be platform. You can use IP within your video games. And of course, that's another layer of licensing that could be an extremely successful model if you think Fortnite and Roblox. Now, very quickly, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry I spent so much time on, on, on IP, but without uh, the part before, it's really difficult to understand the part after. Open source and artificial intelligence are amazing. They can save a lot of time, can improve the quality of, of the work and can improve the speed of creation and the quality of the creation. But remember, they are license. They are IP license, most of the time copyright licenses. Now, open source, you know the rep re repositories, you, you probably know them. The thing is open source is not only one, there are different licenses connected to open source. And the different licenses are different because they're licensing different things with different conditions. So the easier way to look at them is to divide them in families. Of course, within the families, they are different. Actually, a, a student of mine told me through this, this difference in, in, in the license per se. And generally, they goes from permissible to weak copyleft to copyleft. The important thing to look in those licenses is not all the rights and all the things that you can do, but always focus on the thing that you agree to do when you further distribute your software. Because this is where the strong difference lies. If you go permissible, at the end of the day, you barely need to credit that open source software that you're using in your game. If you go towards copyleft on the other side, that may impact on the way you can redistribute your software. So even using a small piece on open source within your game, you might actually agree contractually to identify your modification and to apply copyleft to the software you build on top of that. So it's really important when you go on one or the repository and you copy the open source software to open the license to check, or if you have an in-house or, or, or a lawyer friends, to actually understand what are the consequences for the rest of your work or using that particular open source. It is amazing, the, the, the quality is incredible. There are a lot of advantages in using open source, but doing it knowing that it's connected to a license. It's not for free, it's not without any string attached. You have to know the string attached. And this, of course, is going to save time uh, and, uh, and, and going to improve the quality of your life. The point is, make an educated decision. Are you OK for your games to go copyleft and not to assert any of your IP on, on your game? You might have an incredible, sorry, an incredible innovative business model for which that would totally make sense. Otherwise, uh, it's probably better to go permissive and to check similar software they are distributed under a different license. Because the license is the key and is what is going to be the most profound. There are concerns, especially now the big companies and big corporation and big publisher and big developer are using open source on security. But that goes beyond uh, my, my, my qualification. I don't know to what extent, but yes, not knowing exactly the person. If the person that is sitting in front of you is writing the code, it probably gives much more certainties than getting uh, the code from, from, from JIT. Jumping very quickly to artificial intelligence, I really hope we can have some, some, some minutes for questions at the end. No, we don't have. <laughs> uh, AI, another thing that is vastly used, 
use it incredibly easy to to speed up the production of your game but again remember that from a copyright perspective even without getting into patent there are issues still on protectability and on infringement you're probably familiar with the getty image and stable diffusion cases in the us open ai has also been sued the problem is the argument is you you feed ai with copyright protected work so you're copying my work whatever it come out has potential to be an infringement so the i uh, provider is infringing copyright in the databases with the risk that the result what you use the ai for to create my infringe copyright even if you technically don't know it because you didn't copy it yourself but it was the eye at the beginning now this is not the thing I'm, I'm most worried the worry is on protectability on whether or not there is copyright protection for the result for the work created by generative ai and in that case who the copyright owner is and on that is curious and i give you here the link so you can check uh, this yourself the licenses they try to deal with this problem they tell you that yes, you do have copyright, however, they, they cannot guarantee that you have it, basically. Because protectability comes to author's intellectual creation or labor, skill, and judgment. You need the human behind. Yes, nothing is entirely purely created by generative AI, but the issue is I create something with AI, and maybe you create exactly the same thing without copying mine. How can I claim my right against you? So use it but use it knowing that there are still questions to be answered. The more creative contribution you have to the software, to the generative AI, into the creation of the assets, the more is easy to claim for your copyright authorship and ownership of the assets, but it's not so straightforward. And then, and I swear this is the last thing I'm gonna say, uh, you can also sum them because now you can actually use AI to write code using open source code in an eye. And there are amazing, I, I don't know if you ever tried them. I mean, I, even I can code a bit using uh, this AI uh, copilot, but this is something that you need to remember. You're uploading your code. You're actually copying your code into the AI and it becomes part of the data set. So if there are any three secrets, you're doing something bad. <laughs> They're doing something really bad. And now, and this, uh, I, I'm going to just leave it with this because I got the news yesterday uh, that Unity is adding two AI tools to the, to the data set. And they're specifying that they are only trained using internal assets. This is to give a little bit of certainty that at least uh, there not be a mid-journey uh, claims at the end. At this point, of course, I'm going to stay here. I'm available for any question and, and to chat with you. I'm sorry for running out of time. I just used, I just love this. And if you want more information, there is a project run by WIPO, the World Intellectual Pro uh, Organization. It's called A Quest for IP. It's online. Uh, there are a series of podcasts, and uh, and uh, they're also they're running some some clinics. So if you have any question, uh, contact us on the WIPO website. And all the other materials, all things that are free to download that I wrote if you're interested. And this is my email if you need anything. I'm sorry. Thank you.